Hello, Ryan here, aka Mac, and welcome. Today, we will be running through the most recent monthly report for the Persistent Universe. As always, a huge thank you to all of my patrons and channel members. Thank you so much for the support, it is truly appreciated. So, before we get to the monthly report, I was recently sent a FlexiSpot BS12 Pro ergonomic chair, and I am so thankful that they did, as I had no idea how much of a difference this chair was going to make to my back. Now, I have been using a gaming chair for the last seven years, and literally the day that I started using this chair, my back felt 10 times better, in particular, my lower back. Now, if you are like me and you spend much of your time sat down, do yourself a favor and get yourself an ergonomic chair. The support is incredible. I had no idea. Now, in the description below, I have put a link to the chair that I am using. Plus, there is currently a spring sale going on where you can get up to 45% off. A huge thank you to FlexiSpot for giving me the chance to try this chair out as it has sorted out my lower back pain. And if you have any questions about the chair, be sure to hit me up on Twitch where I can answer any questions or show you it while I'm live. But with that said, let us get to the video. So starting with the AI features team, they continued to fix bugs and make improvements to the human combat and other AI behaviors. For the AI tech team, they worked on finalizing and polishing Alpha 323 features, plus they optimized existing systems like the planetary navigation, which was completed, it says, and now they can generate navigation mesh over an entire planet. And although this new method brings new challenges, it will allow navigation mesh to be generated everywhere on all types of planets and moons. Now, this is a big win, as there were some issues with the previous method, especially around the poles of a planet. So hopefully, whatever the issues are with this new system, they can fix it up and start pushing out AI to all areas of planets and moons, especially now that fauna and creatures are making their way out. Speaking of which, for Boyds, the team continued to implement new rules and finalized synchronization between server and clients. They also iterated on new ship behaviors with the aim of greatly improving the AI combat experience. Now, I have read in some 323 patch notes, and I have heard a few people saying that the NPC flight combat is drastically improved over what it was, the AI can react to what players are doing, and many have said that the AI feel more like a human player rather than an NPC. Now, talking of navigation links, the AI tech team reduced the computation cost over a frame. Subsumption loading logic improvements were also submitted that will more clearly show possible problems with the data so the designers can fix them sooner. And finally, on the AI tool side, the team continued to improve and iterate on Apollo, not the ship. Now, for the animation team, they have been working on the Space Cow, also known as the Cathy Grazer, Although we are yet to see this in Alpha 323, I would love to think it's gonna come, but I would have thought we would have seen it by now. Uh, a medium sized bird being the Maroc, which is in 323, and also the wolf like predator creature being the Copians, which again are in 323. Plus, the team worked on several new vehicle entrance animations. Now, for the character art team, they completed a range of branded racing flight suits and continued working on outfits for the Headhunters gang with the character concept art team beginning to explore specialist armor. Now, that is gonna be very interesting as these specialist armors are gonna be more focused on each particular career or profession, allowing players to have suits to support that role in a lot more depth than just the generalized suit. So really can't wait to see what comes from this. I will certainly be collecting them all and eventually displaying them in my hangar. Now, for the core gameplay team, work continued on pre-production for base building, with gameplay features working closely with art and design to refine requirements and define metrics. So finally, we have some word on base building. It is great to hear that it has now entered development, albeit pre-production, but it means things are now progressing. And although it will be a long while before we see anything tangible, or at least in our hands especially, uh, I do hope that they talk about the plans for base building a lot more throughout this year. This is going to be a huge system, and I'm sure we're all very excited to learn more about it, but it sounds like they are getting the foundation for this feature kind of established on paper, and then they will start building it from there. Anyway, moving on. The team also added different colored loot screens, depending on whether the player is looting an enemy, a friendly or neutral entity, 
and they added separate loop screen styles between the visor and lens. And I have noticed the nice subtle difference between when you have your helmet on or off, how the UI changes for basically the same information, be that your health, your heart rate, that kind of thing. But the different UI they use when you're wearing a helmet versus wearing your, you're not wearing a helmet, using your contact lens is nice and subtle. Now for EV8, the team fixed an issue that now allows players to customize weapons and perform a two-handed carry for the new EVA system, which of course is going to be very much needed. So nice to see them continuing to push EVA, getting it to, I suppose, the same sort of standard as FPS while you're on foot. They also provided support for backward and sideways flying animations. The EVA thruster packs now also relate correctly to the layer of equipment players are wearing, meaning that the visual effects will come from the thruster nozzles on the armor piece or backpacks instead of the undersuit. So again, a nice attention to detail there. Gameplay features made further improvements to prone locomotion, plus support was provided to animation to unlock animation asset production. Now for master modes, improvements to aiming and targeting for the gunnery system were completed and ESP saw further improvements, including smoother response to player input. And ESP stands for extra stick precision. So you wanna tick that up if you're using a stick. Now development of the resource network continued with electromagnetic emissions now based on power consumption and infrared emissions based around coolant and heat generation. Now this is great stuff. Finally sorting out the signature system and making them actually based on what is happening. Meaning with the engineering systems, we will actually be able to tune them and keep our emissions down and should also be leading more towards the ability to do proper stealth. Not to mention the use of radars and scanners that will help to further expand on exploration gameplay and analyzing data from long distance scans to determine what something could be. Hopefully we will hear more about this kind of stuff as soon as the resource network gets further fleshed out, as I think that is more of a prerequisite for things like signatures, radars and scanners, and eventually exploration to be properly developed. Now it says a temporary solution for ship hull penetration was added until Maelstrom is ready to support physical ship armor, with the team saying, this system is subject to change as development and testing progress, but currently all projectiles can deplete armor health. However, only ballistic weapons can penetrate the hull and damage internal components. Now, this is really interesting. And although it is a temporary solution until this physical damage system is in, it should represent how it's going to feel and act while we wait for the Maelstrom system. This tells me that they are potentially aiming to roll out the resource network or engineering systems to the persistent universe before the Maelstrom system is ready, otherwise they would just wait until that's done. It might just be for testing purposes for Arena Commander, but still, things will change massively once Maelstrom comes in, as it will be moving to a physical-based system. Now, for life support, the team optimized the dynamic room atmosphere system and made it network compatible. Also, various improvements and refactors were made to the room system, and various debug tools were greatly improved to allow the team to test the system before the player facing UI is complete. So another system here to make owning a ship more detailed and immersive, ensuring that the temperature, the oxygen level and atmosphere inside your ship is safe for humans or using it to sabotage other people's ships. There is lots to this system and don't worry, the engineering system is not going to be a big pain to keep up with if you don't want to spend much time on it, they will have presets that will do the day-to-day -day stuff just fine. But if you wanted to push it and create your own bespoke setups, you can do so. If you are someone who wants to get very adept at using that system, you can then charge for your services to come in and tweak other people ships who may not have as much understanding. So generating more of that skill element and allowing those who spend the time learning to reap the benefits. Now for transit, the team supported cargo elevators and instanced hangars, which required adding hangar destination exporting, communication between the transit and instance managers for available hangars, the ability to dynamically add destinations to transit carriages, requests for the creation of hangars, and support for capturing peripherals in dynamically added hangars. And after all that, the team moved on to planning and architecting a refactor to the whole transit system to prepare it for the future. And hopefully 
This refactor will resolve all of the current issues with the transit system, but this is also likely getting it ready for server meshing. But as you can see there, there is a lot of complexity to hangars and the cargo elevators and how they all work and how they interact with all the other systems. So as Chad said, this is one of the reasons why they had to push it back slightly rather than releasing it with 323, but hopefully they can get that resolved pretty sharpish and get it into our hands. Now, for radars and scanners, the team updated radar zone queries to use new zone query time splice tech to improve performance. Work also began on signature categories, which allow the team to apply different signature detections based on emitters. And this can be used to independently detect components on a ship with higher emissions, like thrusters compared to offline shield generators. So again, more work going on here for radars and scanners and the signature system, all very important for many areas of the game. Now for Arena Commander, design focused on supporting the engineering experimental modes and a selection of new maps and modes as well. Progress was also made on reputation-based hostility with the team fixing several issues with the new rep system, with changes also made to the trespass behavior and now all factions will defend a trespass zone if it is owned by them, and factions with the appropriate settings will also be able to defend allied trespass zones as well. So nice to finally see work on this reputation-based hostility come along. Should open up a lot more opportunities for more players, and reputations as a whole getting fleshed out should make the grind, or any grind that we are doing, more rewarding as well. Now for the Mobiglass, the developers completed payment validation for beacons and fixed several bugs. Now beacons are going to become far more important now that the Mobiglass has been updated, as these will serve greatly as a safe way for players to offer and accept missions of all kinds from other players. So it needs to be super robust and expandable for all the other beacons to come, which should be now possible that the Mobiglass has been updated. Now for missions, gameplay features provided a new data structure to mission design so they could start setting up hauling missions. Really looking forward to learning more about all of the cargo missions coming along in not 323 but 323 point whatever. Also the overall framework for the offline version of the mission service progressed while mission service debug UI was extended to server meshing. Improved debug tools were added to cargo hauling missions as well, like the ability to debug complete parts of the hauling order to simulate collecting or delivering via freight elevators. And March saw progress on hangars, including the instanced interior manager that handles instancing logic and reserves gateways for transitioning between the outside world and the hangar. And now players calling an elevator or retrieving a ship in supported locations will create an instance hangar that the transit, air traffic controllers, and law systems correctly respond to. Again, sounds very complicated. Now, improvements were also made to the freight elevator kiosk, including the layout, branding, tool tips, delivery screen, and platform handling. And currently, the developers are integrating the kiosk with the personal inventory framework. And the item banks are now functional and correctly use the storage locker. Again, these are features that are coming in an interim patch, be that 323.1, 0.2. So hopefully it is 0.1 and we can get using them soonish. Now for the commodity kiosk, updates were made to the design along with the packing behavior and auto loading display. And finally for the team, support was given to the lighting and visual effects content teams towards ship loading platforms as well. Now moving on to the economy team. They continued to rebalance commodities, making sure they have a scalable algorithm that will work for other systems like crafting. And it will be amazing to get all of the commodities accurate in terms of value, which will certainly help to enhance the cargo hauling profession. But then, of course, fluctuations in prices will change this, their availability, where they're found, where you're hauling them to. It all has to make sense from the beginning. So great to see work going on there. Also, mission rewards are being rebalanced according to the difficulty and time required to complete them. And as part of this, the team are working to better understand how much effort and time is required to perform specific activities in-game, plus in-game pricing is currently underway for new harvestables and hangar flare as well. So nice to hear them saying about specific activities 
as this could be things like mining, or even the intricacies of how you go about gathering your cargo and so on. Just making sure that you are being rewarded fairly for the effort and the time that it takes. Uh, but firstly, new harvestables are likely referring to the creatures, being the gem from the Maroc and the horn from the Copian. It's also fun hearing about hangar flare pricing, as this is the stuff that we can buy to display in our hangars, but ultimately getting all of the mission payouts balanced and accurate based on all of these factors will be a great step to making everything seem more fair and rewarding depending on what you're doing, but also making that grind feel good, which is very important. We don't want a boring grind, we want a deep sense of achievement grind. So I look forward to seeing how this will impact the missions. Don't know if it's for 323 or later on, but there are definitely a lot of changes in 323 anyway. Now the economy team are also currently involved in the design of reputation and org progression and are starting to balance the time and cost of auto loading freight elevators plus provided support for cargo missions. And talking more about the grind, another major aspect of enhancing our gameplay is definitely getting the grind that we do properly balanced to feel rewarding, making progression itself fun, but also as you gain rep, getting the payments to scale accordingly to encourage progression itself. Uh, now finally for the economy team, a comprehensive list of all intended resource sources, transformers and sinks were created to help ensure the economy is stable for the long haul. So a lot of amazing information there. The economy team are working seriously hard to get this stuff organized and in line. There is a lot of discrepancies all over the place in all areas of the verse right now. So hopefully they can bring some order and clarity to the verse when it comes to deciding on what we want to do. Now for the graphics, visual effects programming and planet tech team, most of their focus was on 323 deliverables. Performance scaling options for the water sim was added as we can see in 323 on the EPTU while various improvements were made to water boundary shading and visor wetness to achieve a seamless effect as players enter water. Also support for distance field collisions was completed for more accurate collisions from vehicles. And we can see on Inside Star Citizen, this stuff looks phenomenal. It is coming into the verse. They are doing a lot of optimizations and adjustments to the water tech just to kind of get it looking as good as possible and performant friendly as possible as well. Even in the last patch, the most recent 323 patch, there has been some updates to water. Now, the Vulcan team worked through several performance issues as they moved closer to match the current renderer performance. And as we have seen, Vulcan is now enabled in 323. However, multi-threading is not, which will bring, they say, a much more significant performance improvement. But they have been doing a lot of tuning and performance optimizations for Vulcan as well. Now alongside this, the team are reworking shaders to reduce the total number of shaders that need compiling when the game starts. Work on global illumination continued as well, with a focus on performance as the team moved towards the internal rollout of the first version for testing by the art teams. And global illumination is going to look phenomenal in the verse. Can't wait to get this, even just in the PTU, to see what it looks like. Very happy to hear that they're rolling out the first version. Although this is in-house testing, it won't be too far away. Now the Planet Tech team started work on Planet Tech version 5 with initial focus on the groundwork required to set up spatial partitioning. They are currently deciding how this will work with server meshing and server crash recovery as well. And if I recall correctly, Planet Tech version 5 is not just for improving things like the visuals of planets, the generation of planets, further enhancing the biomes, but also getting it set up for things like base building. Uh, and finally, on the visual effects programming side, in addition to water improvements, the team continued with networking support for the fire simulation and making changes to the AI render layer to enable support for holographic weapons, for example, muzzle flashes, projectiles, enemies, and impacts. And I do wonder when we will see the fire simulation come along. Hopefully, once these initial tests of the engineering mode in Arena Commander are done, they will then begin to roll out things like fire, as I suppose it is systemic and based on what is happening with your ship's components, although it might be more of a networking issue than the feature itself that needs to be sorted. We will see. Now, next up, we have the in-game branding team who worked on Invictus Launch Week, plus they worked on cargo containers 
and additional signage for various locations, which are also nearing completion. And I expect to see quite a few more cargo containers of all brands and commodities once that rolls out in a 323 point patch, just so that we can see at a glance what someone is hauling. Now for the interactables team, item banks, which are apparently now called gear storage, were finished. Explosive containers were reworked and now replace the static meshes in levels, which can explode when shot. And I can confirm shooting these at distribution centers do blow them up. The fire extinguisher recharge cabinets progressed and are currently being taken to final as well. So very interesting they state recharge stations for fire hydrants, as this means they can maybe recharge over time or time and time again. Really handy if you've used it instead of having to buy a brand new fire hydrant, you can just put it back on the holder and it will recharge it. Uh, also cargo hover trolleys are being finalized in prep for the cargo hangar updates. Now for the lighting team, alongside tasks for instanced hangars, freight elevators and distribution centers, they also worked on Invictus launch week. Plus they supported the upcoming character customizer. I'm actually pretty excited to see Invictus this year. I feel like there is a solid chance we will see the Polaris come along and the chances are the Retaliator and its modules are set to release for Invictus as well. Plus anything else that they have been working on that we don't know about. So it should be a good one this year. They've been very sneaky. Now the locations team polished content for Alpha 4.0. They also closed out the distribution centers, which do look incredible, I will say. And the sheer size of them are immense. You can get lost inside them. They're so big. Uh, plus the locations team kicked off the pre-production of new mandates that are officially beginning in quarter two. No idea what these are, but excited to find out. Now the landing zone team finished out for instanced hangars and prepared them for implementation across the burst. Now moving on to the mission design team. They have changed from being the mission feature team and says they will continue to build scalable modular content for the persistent universe. And after feedback on the overdrive event, the team is revisiting the standard data heist mission, trialing a change that will allow a singular version of the mission to be accepted by four players who will play together as contractors in an effort to free up missions and locations and create a similar effect to the Overdrive initiative where people who usually play solo are playing as a team. Work progressed on the upcoming cargo hauling missions as well, with players being tasked with hauling tracked goods from one location to another as requested by a shipping company. And with a consistent payout of roughly 20% of the cargo's value, with the intention of a hauler's income being more stable than that of a commodity trader who is playing the markets. So really nice to finally hear how these cargo missions are going to play out. We're basically running goods for companies in game, making a steady living based on how much of a load we are hauling or we want to haul and likely the distance and dangers involved as well. Now, this is going to be how we build good reps with companies, opening greater contracts and receiving rewards like uniforms and ship skins and other items as well. Really can't wait to see this come along. And again, this is a 323 point patch, not a 324 or later on, it will be within the 323 branch. Now, it goes on to say that while the player is legally allowed to transport the goods, they do not own them. And so lawful stores across Stanton won't buy them if they were to try and sell them on. So the only way to sell these commodities would be to deliver them to a fence, which is basically a no questions asked shop generally found in shady areas of the Stanton system. And of course, they would not pay the full amount of the commodities value. So again, really nice to hear more about this. Having an actual fence to go and offload your goods, your stolen goods to is going to be great rather than it just being a random kiosk in the middle of a space station, having more of an actual shop location will be nice. Now, as we know, Alpha 323 brought with it the first fauna in the game, and there are going to be three new mission variants for these creatures. The first one is a simple kill X amount of creatures described as a population control mission, tasking the player to kill a set amount of animals with the player needing to locate them first. The second mission is to clear locations of creatures, which is a specified location. And then the third mission is to kill and collect, where players must locate the creature, kill the creature and harvest the resources from them, be that the gem from the Maroc bird or the horn from the Copian. Now, of course, it would be nice in the future to have missions that don't just involve killing the creatures, 
and I'm sure they will bring plenty of those missions as well, but as a starting point, this is certainly a nice addition. And although the animals aren't always working great, it's still amazing to see fauna in the game, and it will certainly expand big time from here on out, with plenty more creatures and animals of all kinds, including missions of all types as well, not just hunting, although it is pretty cool getting set up for a hunting mission, getting the right equipment, and then going out and seeing if you can find them. I do enjoy it. Now, after a recent hire, some of the older mission modules were refactored, with the Destroy Illegal Satellites mission receiving a small facelift. Uh, this I'm actually quite happy to hear about, not specifically this mission, but that they are going through the older missions and getting them working and up to date with the latest tech. It is such a shame that many of these old missions have just been left behind, so getting them fixed up and working will just be a breath of fresh air. Also for the mission team, it says, following further testing of Blockade Runner, a smaller change was made to ensure the event stays fun and engaging for all players. And finally, work on the Xenothread events continued alongside freight elevators. Now next up we have the narrative team who worked closely with design to support a variety of content, from revisiting existing missions like the new player experience, to outline new missions being developed to support upcoming gameplay. And I suppose this will be a continued process, keeping the new player experience mission up to date as things change from patch to patch. The team continued to iterate on future narrative initiatives designed to bring more character and stories to the universe, which resulted in a series of proposals that have been reviewed with design. Narrative also continued to outline ways to improve AI behaviors to sell more of the Star Citizen lore, and it's going to be very interesting to see how they utilize AI to bring more of the lore to the game, maybe hearing background conversations about certain stories or things that we've read about in the lore. Uh, and finally, Narrative met with some of the gameplay teams to talk over the lorification of upcoming systems. So again, nice to see more of the lore getting integrated throughout the game, not just for Stanton, but for Pyro, Nyx, and everywhere else as well. Next up, we have the online technology team who worked toward refactoring the social services backend. They are also working to reduce the easy anti-cheat false positives in prep of enabling sanctioned enforcements. Now, it'll be interesting to see what kind of impact sanctions have on players with the potential threat of getting banned could reduce certain griefing behavior. Finally, the team finished off long-term persistence work for the character customizer, enabling players to save their characters between patches. And that is one of the best features for 323, in my opinion, being able to just load in your character rather than have to go through and keep designing them. Now, for the research and development team, they continued working on the temporal render mode. Tracking objects moving through clouds was improved so that history can be rejected or kept as correctly as possible. Also, the soft depth for clouds and atmosphere was improved, with the depth information being crucial to properly handling history rejection when moving through clouds. Now, I really hope that with the recent updates to clouds, which do look so much better in 323, massively better, but now that that is done, I hope that they can start properly developing weather systems of all kinds. Star Citizen's environments will really come to life when we have things like rain. And I know they said that they are just basically waiting for clouds to get to a certain standard before they can start working on weather. So fingers are crossed. That is what they needed to do for clouds and weather can start coming along. Now for the tech design team, they supported various areas of development for Alpha 323 and beyond. Hangers were supported alongside ship flight, including iteration on new AI behaviors to make them more responsive to player actions. And although I am, as I say, I'm yet to test it myself, they should be a lot more human-like and a lot more challenging as well. For the UI team, they worked on the new cargo gameplay updates, which included the development of the new freight elevator kiosk, commodity kiosk, and item bank. And they also prepared mandates for later this year, which include the resource network and jump points, amongst other Alpha 323 features. And finally, we have the visual effects team who finished their work on distribution centers and freight elevators, plus they completed tasks for several upcoming vehicles. So clearly there are several vehicles in the works. I do wonder when we will see what new vehicles are coming in the 323 branch. Finally, progress continued on jump point effects, including concepting based on new gameplay considerations that became apparent during testing. So, there you go. That was the most recent monthly report for the Persistent Universe. 
It is a long video. Apologies it took so long to get this video released. There is plenty of stuff going on there. Great to hear about base building pre-production, all of the work going on for radars, scanners, signatures, hull penetration test, the resource network, massive economy changes, the Planet Tech version 5 and all the work going into missions and cargo missions. There is so much stuff rolling out with 323 and 323 point patches, so it's really starting to shape up now. But with that said, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please do consider subscribing and helping the channel to grow. Also, come and hang out over at twitch.tv forward slash supermacbrother. You are all more than welcome over there. Hit the thumbs up if you don't mind, it does the channel a big favour, and tick that notification bell if you would like to be notified when my videos go live. Again, a huge thank you to my patrons and channel members. Cannot do this without you guys. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.